This evening, friends, we are beginning a series of five discussions to deal with the concept of the bodies of man in Indian philosophy. It is a most intriguing problem, and one about which, of course, we cannot exhaust the existing knowledge. But perhaps a somewhat more adequate understanding of the relationships between the various parts of the compound which we call man will have practical utility in helping us to organize and integrate a practical and vital philosophy of life. So we will begin with the physical body, which in religion, of course, has been very largely neglected. Uh, to the average person, the physical body becomes a symbol, per se, of materiality. Yet this by no means exhausts the symbolism involved. We think of things physical and things material as identical. Actually, the physical world in which we live and the physical body, which is our own peculiar and personal dwelling place, these are not materialistic things in our use of the term. Perhaps it would be better to say that the physical body of man is a mudra, which means a seal. It is a kind of strange and mysterious design. It is the extension of energies and principles into corporeal structure. And the body itself is a strange and wonderful picture of the entire process of creation. This led the medieval alchemists to say that the supreme power and its wisdom had given man three books to study. The universe, holy writ, and the human body. All three of these should be subjected to understanding, to analysis, to consideration. Not merely for their own sakes, but for the sake of truth. And for the sake of the mysteries which are locked in them and which can best be discovered through a thoughtful and careful analysis of bodily structure. In the human body, man has one of the most intricate designs and structures which it is possible for him to examine. He has one tremendous advantage also. For in the study of the body, he is studying something intimate to himself, something which he inhabits. And who can understand a house better than the man who lives in it? And in what direction can he turn in search of instruction, which is more direct, more personal, more intimate, more inevitably brought to his consideration than this corporeal organization in which he dwells? Many times we realize how apt the parallel is between the human body and an automobile. For in the study of man, we find that the human compound as an archetypal design is reflected into everything that man does. And there is no construction which he has ever devised which he has not taken from nature. And nearly every important advancement in science has come as the result of man's study of himself and of the tremendous and wonderful organization which exists within him. An organization which teaches him government, teaches him science, art, and gives him the rudimentary principles of philosophy. 
In the case of the automobile, we have several very useful parallels. First of all, we have the physical structure of the machine, a structure which is improved as rapidly as man's ingenuity permits. Sometimes, like the human body, it is not improved, it is merely complicated by what we term progress. But assuming that a machine is well built, suitable to the purpose for which it was intended, it stands before us a glittering, inanimate thing, of itself incapable of motion, incapable of any activity except existing. And this is the primary state of the human body. So we must support this device, we must animate it. We must bring out its purposeful utilities by various further contributions. First of all, the automobile must have fuel. And in a combustion engine, there must be both fuel and air. And in the case of man, fuel and air are represented by nutrition and respiration. And if these are added to the car, we then have a potentially movable thing, but it still stands still, because this is not enough. So we must add to this also an electrical circuit. And an electrical circuit corresponds in the, in the car to the distribution of the tactic energies in the human body. By means of a constant motion of energy, we are able to fulfill the reasonable expectancies of a combustion motor. So now we have a motor still more capable of action, but still doing nothing. So to these others, we must add something which the man in your service station will forever bring to your attention. And that is that if you want your car to last a long time, you must be sure to keep it lubricated. So we have a lubricational factor. And lubrication, in this case, means the distribution of oil. And the purpose of this oil is to reduce the friction of moving parts. From the very beginning of time, oil has had a tremendous symbolical meaning. Melchizedek, the priest of Salem, anointed the patriarch's head with oil. The oil of baptism. The oil of salvation had the same meaning long ago that it has now. For the purpose of it in your car is to save the car, to keep it from wearing out before its time, to preserve the fine adjustments, and to coat all these moving parts with a protective covering. Now in the human body we have the same procedures carried on through the secretional functions within the body itself. And we also are reminded of this mysterious power of grace, a strange intercession of a principle of salvation, which is as important to man as it is to the maintenance of his car. So now we have everything. But the car stands just exactly where it stood in the first place. Because the one thing is now lacking without which the invention itself is a wonderful but meaningless thing. And that's the man who owns one. In other words, the driver. The person who uses the car. It is the person who stops and starts it. It is the person who employs it to carry him to his various destinations. And this car can cause in the person a number of very interesting psychological reactions to a great many very humble, rather unimportant, drab personalities. An automobile is power. It is a wonderful opportunity to go down the road at a tremendous rate of speed to make other people get out of your way. A car also is something, the first few days you have it, you polish it carefully and then proceed to neglect it completely. The only difference is, of course, with the body, you have to wait quite a while before you can turn it in on a new model. <laughs> but the individual with the car may be going
going somewhere and he may be going nowhere. He may need it in his business. He may need it for his pleasure. It may be called into service for many purposes, but the man who drives the car is the master of it. And it exists for his use. It exists to accomplish, his, accomplish the purpose of his mind or his emotions. This car has no will of its own, no purpose of its own, no destiny of its own except the junkie. In this case, in man, that he shall join his ancestors in the sleep of the earth. This car is meaningful because of the mind that makes use of it. And here we have so many parallels and so many philosophical implications you can extend them almost indefinitely. But the major point that we have to analyze is that no matter how perfectly the body may operate, or how healthy it may be, how brand new and shiny like this year's model of an automobile, the car is only really important because of the use that is made of it. It is only valuable because man needs it. And if man did not need it, it would disappear forever from the earth. In the study of the human body, therefore, we know that it was called a van or vehicle, the horse upon which the rider rides, or the chariot in which he is drawn, or the wagon, the vehicle of a living, conscious being. We would never for a moment acknowledge the probability or possibility that the automobile and the man who drives it, these two are one. We would never want to assume that the driver could be mistaken for the car, or the car be mistaken for the driver. Yet in studying man, we constantly make this mistake. We have not yet learned to understand that all physical things are alive only because of a light that is imparted to them. Each naturally has its own basic life. Even an automobile has a basic life. The very elements of which it is composed, if we could magnify them and study them sufficiently, each of these minute atoms or electrons is a living thing. But the significance of the car is due to the organizing power of a more highly evolved life that uses it. And it is the same in the compound of man. This human body which we have is valuable to us because it is a means of our journey. It is the way in which we travel out of the past into the present and forward to the future. It is our link with objectivity, with the universe of phenomena around us. It is our means of growth. For well, not only can we express ourselves through the instrument of the body, but through the sensitivity of the sensory perceptions of the body, we can take into ourselves experience, understanding. We can observe and find the subject for reflection and contemplation. Thus the body is our connection, a bridge upon which traffic moves two ways by which the individual moves out into manifestation, and by which the manifested universe moves into the individual for comprehension, to be known, to be analyzed, to be considered. Therefore, the body, like a good machine, is very valuable to us. And very few persons would consider giving as little thought and attention to their automobile as they do to their bodies. Very few would be satisfied to permit their bodies uh, to pass into premature desuetude. If this body was appreciated and known as we appreciate and know an automobile. So we have this basic concept now of the body and the person in it. And this evening we are to deal principally with the body itself, how we can learn from it and what we can learn from it to realize that it is not good or bad any more than an automobile is good or bad. If there is an accident, we do not usually blame the automobile. Or if we do, it is because of defective parts, often due to neglect. 
actually a serious traffic violation is accredited to the driver where the difficulty properly belongs. In the same way, the body, about which we have many negative legends, is scarcely ever responsible uh, for the unfortunate publicity which it receives. It is the person misusing or abusing the body which is the result of nearly all difficulties in which the body passes. Knowing the body itself to be composed of certain basic materials, depending for their usefulness and their animation upon a vital energy moving through them, we see that the body is sustained and maintained primarily by internal energy. This internal energy is said to exist as a great stream of power, a universal electrical system, and within man there are certain poles by means of which universal energy can be captured, and as a stream of light flow into the body, where it is differentiated into five important streams which are called tapas. Of these, the fifth contains the other four, and the four flowing out of the fifth are like the rivers that flowed in the ancient story of Eden, the four rivers that water the world. And these rivers of energy flowing into the body, animating it, preserving it, and protecting it, giving purpose and meaning to its functions, and maintaining the eternal process of generation, perpetually going on within the body structure itself. These streams of life, under normal conditions, can and do preserve and protect the body against sickness, against malfunction of any kind, and against premature uh, destruction or wearing out of the body. Now, energy is a more or less irresistible force, and the body is a vast receptacle, like a reservoir, into which this energy flows and through which it is distributed by the intricate systems of nerves, veins, arteries, lymphatics, glandular structures, etc. These distributions allow energy to reach all parts of the bodily structure, and this energy is interpreted in each area according to the needs and requirements of that area. So that, as the Hindu points out, each of the nerve filaments of the human nervous system end in a figure of a deity, for the termination of every nerve is in some little area of life, and in that area, that nerve is God, maintaining, preserving, vitalizing, most of all, giving a spark of light, like the spark of electricity from the battery in the automobile. If, then, energy is this irresistible force, most difficulties of the body arise from the impeding of energy flow. Wherever energy meets obstruction, there is conflict. And if the energy is unable to overcome the obstruction, then we have the natural ground of pathology. For well, nearly all pathology begins or originates in interference with the natural circulation of life. The moment we, one way or another, divide life from itself, isolate it, uh, cause it to lose its root, which is in the common life. If we kill the root, ultimately the whole plant or tree will die. Also, if for one reason or another, we injure a branch or part of the tree, then this will die, unless the injury is not too severe. If it is repairable, nature will repair it. So we may say, generally speaking, that most sickness that can come to man is the result of obstruction to the natural motion, process, and function of the body. Now, the body, we may say, can, under certain conditions, develop such interferences and such obstructions of itself. 
This is not common, however, except when the body has worn a long time and has been subject to a considerable amount of abuse. Normally speaking, the obstructions which are liable to damage the body are either accidental due to circumstances about which the individual may have no control, or they are the result of disobedience to the rules and regulations relating to body. Now, if body is only a machine, it is very much like a machine in another way, namely, that a machine is no device about which we can hold abstract sentimental attitudes if we expect it to run. Now, if the car breaks down, no amount of argument will start it again, nor will any uh, prayers addressed to abstract space be likely to take the place of a burned-out theory. Also, we will observe that platitudes do very little good, and the general advice of an individual who knows nothing about motors is also seldom effective. When the body of the car, or when the motor of the car, becomes ill, there's only one thing to do, and that is take it to an expert, and hope he is as expert as he should be. Now, in connection with problems relating to the body, as in mechanics, these problems relate to immutable laws. There are right and wrong ways of doing everything. The wrong way will always end in trouble. And the right way will prevent the trouble or perhaps assist in its correction. But there is no possible way of neglecting the car without ultimately regretting it. And there is no way of neglecting the body with any better fortune. So with the body, as with all things in the material world, we are working with exactitudes. Now granted, man does not understand all of these. And a great part of the mystery of the body remains unsolved. But we have every reason to believe from past experience that when it is solved, it will be lawful. That it will represent absolute and exact principles. And that the skillful use of knowledge is the only way by means of which the body can be maintained just as it is the only way in which the car can be repaired. Thus, from all physical things, the body, the world around us, the world within us, for that matter, we learn one of our first great lessons, as the Hindus have pointed out, namely that we are living in a world of exactitudes, and that in this world there is no substitute for essential knowledge that all the well-wishing and the good-hoping in the world will not take the place of facts. Man of his own will and accord does not like to face facts. He would like to live in a fairyland, a world of miracles. The material universe teaches him that there is only one complete and inscrutable miracle, and that is the total of existence itself. The mystery of it is beyond his comprehension. But wherever he does understand, the miracle disappears and law and order takes its place. And what we so call a miracle is a scientific process, or a fact, the cause, means, ultimate of which we may not understand. But there are no miracles in the universe. There is only law unfolding. And those who understand and obey achieve those securities which appear miraculous to the uninformed. So from the physical world we learn the importance of law and order and of the integration of our resources and of the organizing of the bodily problem. Now the body being a very useful instrument, we must give it some attention. For while it is wonderfully and strangely strong, it is also wonderfully and strangely weak. The body can stand a tremendous amount of abuse, but then it may suddenly break. It can stand a great deal of one kind of strain and very little of another. 
And each human being has to learn to know what his body can do, how much of it he can afford to expend in terms of energy, motion, effort, time, strength. Failure to understand the body and to recognize its proper rights and privileges will again lead to the destruction of its utility. And if the body is damaged beyond a certain point, this house, this palace of man's purpose becomes his dungeon and his prison. So the purpose is always to preserve the distribution of energies and to prevent obstructions, to prevent the building of tensions and stresses by which the body will be subjected to an unreasonable strain. Realizing that energy moving from its own roots and source within and behind man and flowing through his body as activity and as sensation, as perception, and as all these different qualities, that this energy may be blocked or may be impaired will cause us to pause and wonder why and how. <clears throat> One of the most important realizations that we have, and we're gradually developing a scientific proof of a philosophic statement, is that the greatest killer in the world is tension. The reason that tension kills is because tension locks processes, because it prevents the free and normal distribution of energy. Wherever there is tension, the bodily energies are damaged, or perhaps more completely, the means of their distribution is damaged. Thus tension is not in the body but is contributed to the body by the driver. And it very often happens that the driver, because he is nervous, excited, unreasonable, careless, may wreck his car. This happens every day with human bodies. And the majority of sickness is due to the same kind of causes that will wreck an automobile. One of the major causes, perhaps, for man is his failure to recognize his responsibility to his body. Bodies, in a funny way, are like children. We either treat them so badly and neglect them so horribly that we repent, or else we spoil them hopelessly. Moderation seems a virtue we know little of. And in the case of the body, the moment we permit it to become the master of our living, it is an inanimate mechanical tyrant. It is like an automobile that may dime us and dollar us to death until we become an absolute servant of trying to maintain the payments on a car that is too expensive for us. On the other hand, to neglect this body, to fail to keep it in order, is also to be punished, uh, to suffer the consequences of neglect or indifference. Thus we find that uh, in terms of philosophy and in terms of ethics, the body is not a principle it is an opportunity and an object lesson. The body is man, one of man's opportunities uh, to be intelligent. It is a present and insistent demand upon him for reasonable care, thoughtfulness, intelligence. And the body, of course, that is best treated is the one which, because it is never abused nor spoiled, forms a very slight equation in our way of life. Gradually, through the moderation of our attitudes and habits, uh, we bring the body to efficiency, if we so desire. And while it serves in this efficient capacity, we hardly know we have one. It's like an appendix. We do not know that's there until we lose it. And in the body, we do not realize our dependence upon it until it begins to reveal um, in distemper of some kind. The body is then, then in Indian philosophy not a principle, uh, not a thing regarded as living in itself, but as something upon which life is focused and through which, as through a magnified glass, its rays are concentrated and then diffused. So the body is a material focal point. 
It is our link with external things, and it is also our ever-present and immediate lesson. Now, there may be reasons under certain conditions why the body may be neglected for some other reason or purpose that is considered more important. But anyone making this decision must abide by it. For if he neglects the body, his motive is of no biological interest. His, mo his motive may be like that of the martyr, who cheerfully allows his body to be burned at the stake rather than to compromise his ideals and principles. But his heroic decision does not prevent his body from being burned. And while it may be that under certain conditions we are forced in the cause of some greater purpose to neglect the body, we must not do this without full realization that our decision involves moral responsibility. If we neglect, we must do so fully accepting the burden or the limitations which will result from such neglect. The belief that because our cause is just or our purposes are good, we will not be forced to meet the debts of nature. So this belief is unsound. The solution lies not on this level, but in the or on the level of decision in which fully knowing what we are doing we are resolved to accomplish a greater good and are willing to pay the penalty for accomplishing that good. Thus the body teaches us its own inflexible requirements and there can be no escape from them. In Indian philosophy the body has certain inalienable rights for it corresponds very closely to the lowest caste in the Indian caste system, namely the caste of the Sudra, or the slave. And the Indian recognized the body primarily as a servant, the purpose of which was to contribute uh, to the function and security of the Brahman, the higher caste which abides within the body. The body, therefore, has its laws and its rules. We never transcend them but by keeping them. And in the yogic disciplines, the body plays a subtle but very important part. For it was the belief of these ancient teachers that the mystery of the body is man's first initiation into the mystery of God. If man cannot guard and keep his body through the conscious dedication of his attention, he will never be able to proceed to other things. Therefore, in the mysteries of the old religions, growth was not through the neglect of body, but through the attainment of a superior state above body, a state, however, that was not attained at the sacrifice of body, but rather through the fulfillment of its rules and regulations. It would take hundreds of textbooks to reveal all the symbolism moral, ethical, spiritual, social, contained within the body. For in it is every system of government, every principle of mathematics, astronomy, music, art, literature, all these principles abide within man and have their parallels and their correspondence, correspondences in the structure and function of his material form. Yet man does not stop there. He goes on. But he should always be mindful of the idea that only those who are faithful unto little things can be made masters over greater things. And the first little thing about which we must be faithful is this carcass of ours, which we are so often inclined to overlook. I know too many people interested in various uh, abstract subjects who would uh, gladly leave the body behind in their race for enlightenment. But they're going to need it all the way because the beginning of their enlightenment, the beginning of all enlightenment, is what is called attention. The ability of the individual to give unto all problems and subjects that attention that is due and proper to them. No man will grow by neglect. No individual will become more secure because he runs away from a lesser responsibility in the search of a greater one. The responsibility on every man's doorstep is his own body. This does not necessarily mean that he must spend the rest of his life catering to it. 
Because as Plato uh, once said about the handsome Alcibiades, there is very little use of being a golden dagger, uh, or rather a leaden dagger in a golden sheet. And that the spirit of man should be asleep, and the body handsome and strong, is not the end of wisdom either. But by a certain knowledge of the body, through a certain study of its laws and rules, man gradually gains a comprehension of the principles behind body. So we now have a new parallel which we have to establish, and that is the parallel between the body of man and the material or visible universe in total. Man's body was turned in the Middle Ages a microcosm, or a miniature of the universe. The greater body, the body of the universe, was called a macrocosm. And these, according to the Hermetic analogy, were bound together by similarities, as above, so below, as in the greater, so in the lesser. Man studying to solve the mystery of his own existence is rather a disadvantage when it comes to trying to solve the riddle of the universe. He cannot explore beyond the stars in space. He cannot examine all the vast mechanisms of the cosmos. They are too profound, too uh, distant, too vast for his comprehension. Yet man does not need to, because he has present with him at all times a miniature of this whole process, a miniature in which every law of nature is present in some form or symbol, a miniature of processes, of means and of methods, and nearly all of the great philosophies of the past have been heavily indebted to anatomy and physiology for their abstract premises. And nearly all of the great religions of the world have patterned their creation myths from the generation myths of the human body. So religion, like all other branches of learning, is closely related to anatomy and physiology. And man seeking the larger answer does so by expanding the visible and possible knowledge which he can gain through the study of himself. Man, know thyself, was written above the gates of the ancient temples, and this axiom still stands as one of the most important of all philosophical injunctions. By the neglect of it, man loses his perspective on larger problems. Now when we analyze this body more, more carefully, we have already said that according to Hindu philosophy, it is not a principle. It is not a principle because it is not actually a self-motivating instrument. It is not a principle because, like the automobile, it must have a driver. The body is not self-moved. It is moved by other things uh, which control and dominate it may therefore not be regarded as having a complete and separate subsistence in nature or in space. The principle of body is archetypal, is universal. Every creature that comes into this world must have some kind of a form appropriate for its manifestation here. And body is always appropriate to the life which engenders it and which uses it as an instrument. Therefore, the evolution of species, the development of kinds, the various kingdoms of nature, the various worlds of kingdoms of plants, minerals, animals, all of these differentiations are also symbolic statements about the degrees of life that are moving through them. For in the achievement of the compound objective personality of man, we find the full statement of man's attainment. We find, therefore, that the body is forever bearing witness to that which is within it. And from the study of the body, if we approach it correctly, we can approach a knowledge of the person in the body, the being by means of which uh, this body is animated and sustained. Thus the body tells us, if we wish to examine it, much of the story of ourselves. We have spoken to you at various times on such subjects as physiognomy, uh, phrenology, uh, palmistry, and uh, graphology, and other symbolic arts which men have devised because they were convinced that by means of the body the nature of the self could be diagnosed. Now obviously, as the Chinese have told us, such a diagnosis requires 
not a superficial investigation, but a very deep and profound analysis. It means that we must be observant of very slight and wonderfully sensitive symbols. And these again invite our attention, invite our serious and careful analysis. Man coming into contact with body and forming an alliance with it gets himself into a series of difficulties. Because in the beginning of his material life, consciousness seems to emerge from body or through body, and man under normal conditions does not have any consciousness of an unbodied state, it is almost inevitable that man should associate body with life, and assume that that which is embodied is alive, and that which is disembodied is dead. Furthermore, the individual building upon this assumption identifies the requirements of his consciousness with those of his body, and assumes that if he serves the body, he serves himself. This has certain truth in it, but is not a complete truth, because the individual who unreasonably and excessively serves his body is usually at the same time doing an ill turn to himself, and all effort to identify body and being, and to build a philosophy of life upon the assumption that they are one and the same, these will end in disaster. Usually this disaster will manifest on a psychological level because the individual has mistaken the machine for the man who operates it. Such a mistake can and often does bring with it a great deal of misery and result in a wrong diagnosis of problems and difficulties with which we are all confronted. One of the most simple, for example, of all of these problems is the aging of the body and the assumption that this means that the person is growing old. That is a very common identification. Uh, someone says to you, how old are you? And you answer 63. You are not 63, the body is. But it never occurs to differentiate between them. Someone says to you, is John a blonde or a brunette? We say he is a brunette. We are saying that his body is. But in our thinking, we do not make that subconscious differentiation. So whatever peculiarities may be manifested in the body, we assume that these peculiarities constitute the person. Now there is a reason why this assumption takes place. For the person in the body is in some way responsible for the fact that John is a brunette. The person in the body is in some way responsible for the attitudes or conditions which we associate with age. And while the person in the body is not 63 years old, the person in the body can enter into a hypnotic acceptance that it is 63 years old, and can transfer this description of the body to its own nature, and gradually begin to develop such symptoms of age as we psychologically would associate with those years. Gradually as time goes on, we are beginning to attack this matter of assuming that the definition of the body is the definition of the being. We are becoming less and less interested in the physical the term of age. We are beginning to agree that we are as old as we feel, and we do not wish to have things done for us or things done to us which remind us that we perhaps are a little past our best years. We prefer to live in the conviction that the thing inside does not grow old. This type of conviction can be very useful to us, because psychological aging is one of our great difficulties in living. And the individual who feels old is older than Methuselah, and the individual who does not feel old can be young at 90. Here is where the identification of body and being results in a distinct and definite loss. 
Another example where we have difficulty, perhaps a little more uh, serious, is the assumption, for instance, that a person who has a certain disease of the brain is insane. It is the body which does not function. It is not the person who is insane. But we do not differentiate between them. And because we have mistaken an injury or obstruction in the brain structure uh, and have interpreted it as an indication of a deficiency in the mind, we may very often uh, bring a certain stigma which is not intended or proper in nature. In a thousand ways, every day, we cheat ourselves a little in some manner or some particular by this identification between body and being. And if we can begin to rescue ourselves from this, life can be much more meaningful and important to us. Now, body brings us with, with it another interesting question. How did body begin? And here we have uh, a great deal of thought from a philosophical level in India, uh, and in other ancient cultures for that matter, which parallels but does not entirely conform with modern anthropological thinking. Anthropology very largely is concerned with the evolution of man as body. Yet anthropology also realizes that somewhere in that long story of the gradual differentiation of man, there was a point, a time of quickening, some mysterious intangible a moment in space or time where man suddenly seemed to begin to become man. And that prior to that, man was a beast, a little better uh, than perhaps the most ingenious of the bipeds. But at a certain time, humanity broke through the mysterious barrier of the animal world. And man, the animal, the material form, <coughs> was asked and dominated only by an instinctive animal nature, changed. And from this organism there began to blaze out man the thinker, from whose rudimentary intelligence has been developed all the complicated way of life that we know now. The ancients believed that form as such, bodies as such, began altogether and in one general way. They began as a result of spores projected in space, and that all life upon planets began or had its origin in the outer atmosphere of these planets. We have from the uh, balloon experiments of Picard and others come to discover that there are what are called three spores in space. They are minute units of life which placed into an environment adaptable to themselves will begin to grow and generate and produce monocellular organisms or structures uh, with one cell uh, for a body. But these spores may have come to the earth, precipitated from space, perhaps as a result of the cooling of a planet and its relationship to the atmospheric area around it. In any event, in the humidity that fell upon the earth, there were spores. And from these, all life on earth, all material forms, had their origin. They were born, therefore, out of the primordial elus, or slime, described in ancient writings. And even our most remote ancestors, who knew very little bit about evolution, uh, had their ancient records to the effect that men were born out of water and through mud, and to the land, and that all life began as a scum upon the surface of water, and that these minute organisms, gradually and folded and complicated through time, little by little these forms grew. Division took place within them, but the primordial cell was not divided any more than it is with the human being whose growing body does not break through the original membrane of the first decundated cell. And so division took place, cells multiplied, structure began, 
and little by little the body of man was built up in the same way that the world was built, step by step and by degrees, through cleavage, through the gradual establishment of zones, first a polar continent and then a subpolar continent, and gradually the cells expanding and extending until we see the gradual emergence of forms as we know them today. But this is the story of bodies, and as these bodies developed, they became vehicles or vehans, drawing to themselves entities suitable to those bodies. And as these bodies became more and more unfolded, higher orders of entities, higher orders of beings, became the masters of these machines. And these higher orders of beings were not only masters of the machines, but they were responsible for them. And the individual is responsible for his body in the vast order of minute life that it develops and unfolds within the body. In time, it is said that those beings which we now call human beings, referred to in the ancient apocryphal book of Enoch as the sons of God, gazed down into the abyss and saw there the forms or bodies, the daughters of men, and descended unto them. And from them was born a race of giants, we have many ancient allegories in the Zohar and in the uh, various glosses to the Old Testament explaining these passages and reminding us that at a certain time the being that we call man took upon himself the coat of skin and in so doing brought us primordial humanity. And from the time that this being entered into man, man was a human being. But man's humanity was not immediately obvious, and for great time he traveled on in bodies of varying degrees of development, passing through stages that parallel very closely the anthropoid and other apes. But always it was man the anthropoid. It was not the other kingdom any longer, because within this being, was, within this body, was now a being which had a potential existence as man. And this continued and unfolded through millions of years until we have reached our present estate, in which we have brought the body nearer and nearer constantly to the needs and requirements of the being in the body. Growth of bodies, therefore, is really being fulfilling itself through bodies. And the power of the impulse of the urge behind bodies to evolve is really the urge of being to express. Therefore, evolution is the growth or unfoldment of life with its reflection in body. Bodies do not grow. Bodies do not provide the materials which we need for growth. The being unfolding through the body produces the phenomenal appearance of growth. For growth is really being possessing its body. Now, we know, for instance, that uh, a young couple may go out and decide to buy a house. And uh, they look around and they find one that has certain advantages, and is approximately the right location, approximately the right size. But what young couple, especially what young housewife, will ever move into a house and leave it the way it is? Such a thing is utterly unthinkable. It may have just been painted, but the color is not quite right. It may have just been refurnished, but it will certainly need a new kitchen, or otherwise she simply can't be happy there. And it is the same way with the being in the body. As being moves into body in the process of birth, being begins to modify the individual form. As beings collectively moved into body at the beginning of the human race, they began to modify collectively this structure causing it to become ever more suitable to the needs of, its, of this particular creature. They say that one of the very earliest things that the new occupant did to the house was to put a thumb on it. Man is the only creature that has a thumb that moves against the fingers. With all the other animals that have similar hand-like devices, the thumb is merely another finger. But with man it is opposed to the fingers because it became in Indian symbolism the symbol of the man himself who grew by bringing the thumb into opposition to the fingers which enabled him to pick things up. 
But of course, one of the real reasons for evolution is that he should pick up a certain number of things as he goes along, principally and particularly ideas, among the last that he has desires to handle, by the way. But the being in the house begins to model it, modify it, change it. And as the general stream of mankind individualizes more and more, the individual modifications of bodies will be more and more pronounced because each one is becoming the instrument for a destined purpose. Now the collectivity of body is also something that's important. And with humanity there is a reservoir of body. In other words, there exists in the universe an available supply of material suitable for one purpose only, and that is for the creation of bodies for a certain type of living creature. And incidentally, every time this material is incorporated into a body, it is brought in contact with a being, and it lives in an association with that being over a period of time. Now we have often noted that some folks like to keep pets, and they'll have a very a happy cat or a very affectionate dog that has been with them a long time, and the longer that dog is with them, the more intelligent that dog seems to become. The more sympathy and love and attention that is devoted upon it the more it seems as though that little animal grows. It takes on something of a, of a neo-human quality. It seems to understand us better and better. It seems to uh, sympathize more quickly with our moods until we finally decide that it's the most intelligent animal. Whether our moods are intelligent or not is not considered. <laughs> In any event, association does have an effect. <coughs> and the association of body with the being in it means that body elements and body principles, body energies and body entities become these minute lives with their vibrating cores. That these minute particles which are assembled to form body and which separate at the death of body and return to their own natural levels again, they pass through a life cycle through their incorporation into our organisms. And when they are separated again from this human compound, and return to their native substances, and this is going on constantly, with someone coming into this world and leaving it every ten seconds. The, there is a constant building of the vibratory polarity of the material which is used to build bodies. Thus we are all inheriting, little by little, better materials. Materials that have passed through organisms that become more refined, more vital, more highly attenuated, and thus we are able to create ever more sensitive and responsive vehicles for our manifestation. Bodies in this way also evolve, and the elements evolving in bodies evolve as we do. For man living in a universe, moving through various experiences, grows, and these elements which are within his personality take on the vibratory changes that his consciousness passes through. And when they return to their substances, they are correspondingly more advanced or more attenuated, more subtle in their own vibratory polarities. Thus, by degrees, the collective substance of body is changing. And this changing of body substance is called attenuation. vibration of the trash bag, which made it a very sensitive, subtle, refined wood. Little by little the wood had grown. The wood was not alive then, it was merely the body of wood, but its vibration was constantly being refined. And so it is with matter. All matter is gradually transforming itself into etheric units, and ultimately this matter that we know around us will disappear and in its place there will be an entirely more subtle state of matter. But don't worry about it, it won't happen at the time that you are owning real estate, I am reasonably certain. <laughs> it will be terrible to think of one of your best frontages slowly vanishing. <laughs> but I might point out that that can also be done by means of taxation. So it's not necessary for you to worry about any disaster uh, at the moment. But in the course of millions of years, matter will gradually reduce itself to etheric units and be much more responsive and much more subtle than it is now. 
and because other more ancient cycles of matter have passed into this state already, we have this mysterious, subtle, or etheric quality which has been called anciently the body of the gods, because beings of higher orders of life are said to be vested in this type of material. So bodies are evolving under our guidance, they are suffering under our abuses, but the gradual motion is that man is growing, that man is learning, unfolding. And just as every year he makes some real and some artificial improvements on his automobile, so nature is eternally refining its product and making it more useful for the purposes for which it was intended. A man working with matter is gradually becoming a master sculptor until, uh, like in the story of Pygmalion and Galatea, ultimately the statue itself will come to life. <clears throat> so we have a little picture of the broad concept of Indian anthropology as it relates to the story of the human body. Now we have to take up another important subject, and that is the relations that we have found so, down, so prominent down through the ages of the growth of spiritual values through various the flagellations and privations of the flesh. In other words, this instinctive tendency of the human being to turn from body. To consider body as something profane. And to consider its various activities as unworthy of his spiritual destiny. This, of course, would be the perfectly natural reaction of the individual in his automobile if you asked him if his car was himself. He would be highly insulted. He would certainly feel that you should realize that he is more intelligent than his car, or he wouldn't be able to drive it. On the other hand, the car is not something which in itself is evil. It is the use that is made of it, or the abuse which determines whether it is a thing of help or a thing of hindrance. And the general attitude, particularly of the medieval man of Europe toward body, was certainly a prejudiced one, one that did not take into consideration the value of body in his life. And I think we must take the same attitude in a little broader way in, re in estimating and evaluating what we call material civilization. Material civilization has something of the quality of a collective body. We would all like to get away from it. We would all like to live in an ideal world where there are no more uh, unreasonable politicians and no more exploitations. We kind of uh, review or regard the material world as a place of trouble. And we are inclined to think of the physical body as something about which we might be slightly ashamed. Actually, the Greeks were much wiser in their uh, estimation of these values. Well, they recognized that the physical body, when it was understood and used properly as it should be, uh, was a magnificent instrument about which no individual should have fear or negation but should recognize it as having been bestowed upon him by an all-wise providence who certainly did not give him something he did not need. The conflict, therefore, again arises between man-made attitudes and nature, and the individual who holds beliefs which are contrary to nature must ultimately suffer, and the belief that the body is some kind of a limitation or hindrance will assume naturally that nature or God, in their wisdom, has bestowed upon man that which is unnecessary, unreasonable, or unworthy. Such cannot be the case. Therefore, that man possesses body, that man is limited by body to, in some ways at least, and is responsible for the maintenance of this form, this must essentially all conspire together for good. Otherwise, it would not exist. In the great systems of ancient teaching, therefore, the tendency was not to take the attitude with which we are somewhat familiar. The Buddhist doctrine, for example, of renunciation, uh, which was a departure from worldliness, has been symbolically misinterpreted. Uh, the uh, would-be holy man has departed from life and all of its responsibilities and retired to a cave on the side of a hill where he lives unbathed and unkempt for the next 50 years. This is not the spirit of the philosophy, however. It is not the purpose of it. Because it is not man's departure from the world that is important. It is the recognition within the being itself that it has a dimension beyond the world that is important. 
It is not man in the world, but the world in man that must be changed. It is the human attitude toward things which leads to abuse and misuse that is at fault. It is the being itself that has misunderstood the world and misunderstood life, and then penalizes the body for its own mistake. Actually, the beginning of true spirituality is a close harmony between the being and the body. And this close harmony uh, is finally expressed through the willingness of the being to assist the body to the perfection of its own duty and purpose. Remember that it is the being that most always pollutes the body. And for once, when the body does an ill turn to being, there are a hundred cases where a being has done an ill turn to the body. It is not the body that runs to excess. It is not the body that seeks all kinds of false gratifications. These things we blame upon the body, but the blame lies within the psychological organism of the human being himself. Consequently, the ancients were very clear in pointing out that the gradual learning of how to normalize the functions of body, this learning carried with it the key to man's internal integration. For that which happens on one level physically happens on another level metaphysically. And the same laws and principles are operating in both cases. Let us say, for example, uh, to use one of the yogic ideas, that an individual wishes to control selfishness. Now, selfishness is a kind of a strange, ethereal, undimensioned thing that when you think you have it, slips through your fingers. And selfishness, when you try to work with it, is so attenuated that the very most unselfish thing you try to do may be your supreme monument to selfishness. You're never sure. You're never sure when you do that good deed, whether it's because you want to help someone or because it pleases you. You never know whose satisfaction is first. Selfishness is a very, very hard thing off in space to work with. And you can so easily talk yourself into saying that you are unselfish and that everybody else is selfish. I know people who say they're the most unselfish beings in the world, but those around them always want to do what they want to do, when this unselfish person really wants them to do what he wants them to do. You can rationalize almost anything. And you can come to the most amazing, conflicting opinions about which no two persons will agree. And yet, it is very difficult to maintain a dynamic disagreement about a stomachache. When it hurts, it hurts. And there is no doubt about it. Also, when you want to correct something, you know when you've corrected it. Because when the body problem has been solved, the body says so. No doubt about it. You can't close your eyes and say, I have no stomach ache, and then open them again, because it's still there. You can use all kinds of pain-killing drugs, but the stomach ache will remain until the cause is removed. Can't fool the body. It is a strange and wonderful teacher. And it is because it is relentless in its resolution that you shall be instructed that we have a tendency to like to escape the whole idea and work it out somewhere else. So when you want to exercise self-discipline, there's no place where it is a more tangible instrument and the results of your attainment are more immediately visible than right in the physical body. If you want to know what your self-control is, there's no quicker way of finding out than with the physical body. And if you do not have that self-control, and must build it, there is no easier or more certain method of finding out how, and to what degree you must develop it, and how it can be strengthened and matured, than when you are working with a simple physical problem that you can see all the values of, and which will remain solved, unsolved until it is solved. There are no emotional escapes. There are no rationalizing of black into white. In the physical body, there must be the answer, or there is no answer. It is a rugged disciplinarian. But when you have put it in order, 
you have achieved a tremendous thing. And immediately you discover that you have the strength to proceed and to continue with achievement upon other levels. The great proof of strength is its sufficiency under actual test conditions. And the body is a perpetual test condition about which there can be no subterfuge or deceit. Thus, if you really are interested in the yogic disciplines, try the simple disciplines that they begin with. The disciplines, for instance, of being able to relax the body. And you will find out that it has attached to it a whole series of conclusions and consequences that you have to do something about. We have people coming in frequently who bring in their problems and they insist that their only real difficulty is the fact that they have a very unpleasant twitch. Whenever they walk down the street and start talking with their friends, they go this way. <laughs> There's nothing the matter with them except this little nervous condition. <laughs> so you start with this uh, minor affliction and you keep on tracing it. And before you get through with it, you find out everything that is wrong with their spirits, souls, minds, and bodies before you can get at the cause of that twitch. And you also have the wonderful realization that until that situation is cured, the twitch won't stop. Oh, it is quite possible that by hypnosis you can take it away. Six months later, the individual will go this way instead. <laughs> The symptoms may change, but they will never disappear until the condition is cured. And no substitutes will be accepted. No half answers. No compromises. Either it is solved or it is not solved, and there can be no doubt. This type of thinking is very good for those who are really interested in building a strong philosophy of life because it gives them this wonderful instrument for checking themselves, for making sure that what they believe they are accomplishing. Now, on the emotional level, the control of appetites, the physical appetites, will indicate very clearly the control of emotional appetites and the control of mental habits. The individual who can't control the physical part will never control the metaphysical part. The answer is, of course, something we hate to believe, namely that the physical is actually the easiest part to control. And the individual who is able to recognize this realizes that he graduates from a less difficult to a more difficult task. And if he does not bring with him some equipment, if he has not made some achievement, if he has not learned to use the interior faculties which he possesses in a moderate way at least, he certainly cannot suddenly summon them to his assistance in a, in a spiritual emergency. So the body starts him off. By the very simple processes of growth, being takes possession of body. But being is never really master of body until it sets itself this goal, that it shall make out of this body as nearly as possible a perfect instrument for the manifestation of its purpose. The immature, inadequate body fails the being on the level of objective function. And you'll be surprised to what degree bodily infirmities can interfere with the rational integration of the being. This does not mean that the being is actually sick, but it means that the manifestation of the being is not complete. And more difficult still, that the testimonies of the body by which the being should be informed are not accurate. The moment the body, because of lack of proper function, because of obstruction, becomes toxic, the entire relationship between the being and the body is sickened. The moment toxin comes in, man cannot trust his eyes, his ears, or any other sensory faculty. He cannot trust his emotions, and he cannot trust his thoughts. Because the toxic condition, as the term implies, carries with it a situation or condition which damages the communication lines between the being and the body. 
A great deal, therefore, of what we might term emotional pessimism may arise from high toxic rate. And the individual who is physically uncomfortable is not in the best condition to learn, to grow, to live, to love, or to work. Thus the body penalizes us for intemperance of all or any kind. And uh, because the average American citizen does not have freedom from toxin, and because toxin may originate either from neglect of body or from tension afflicting body, the average citizen's opinions and attitudes are not sufficient. He is not adequate as a citizen. He is not adequate as a voter. He is not adequate as a businessman or as a family man, simply because the relation between being and body are not healthy. The relations are not normal or reasonable. So he goes along and he makes a whole series of bad decisions. He is, he is too nervous. He is too upset. He loses his temper too early, easily. And the first thing you know, he loses his job. And out of these tragedies and disasters, he develops negative attitudes. He becomes abused. He becomes fearful. He becomes persecuted. And in time, completely mentally and emotionally sick. Because he did not keep these communication lines open. The Chinese say, and they are very well known for their wisdom on many points, that all human beings begin to die in the intestines. And this means the greatest area of toxic build. And it is also in this area that you get the greatest obstruction of energy fields. And therefore, that is why the trouble generally starts in that area. So the person who wishes to grow, wishes to know, wishes to become a sufficient human being, has this basic and certain responsibility to the vehicle that has been given to it. And with this responsibility in mind, he must recognize the need for maximum function in every way possible. He must experiment sometimes with himself, because there is no common rule in these things. One man's meat is often his brother's poison. But each must find the levels and the planes upon which his own function is most complete, in which there is the least abuse of natural laws in the achievement of purposes which we have set in motion. When we find these levels of action, we then maintain a close harmony between being and body. Now, body gives man another instrument which he has to think about a great deal, and that is this hand with the five fingers, or the four fingers and the thumb, which we mentioned to you. Uh, because he has this, he can hold a hammer or a monkey wrench, and also he can hold a delicate scientific instrument or a pen and write a book or a sword and win a battle. Actually, the hand is that part of the body by which man releases certain archetypes. And in ancient religious symbolism, the hand of God was always the symbol of the expressing power of God. And the hand of God in man is represented by the human hand, which is the expressing power of the human being. There is a direct communication between the brain and the hand. Perhaps this is most obvious in something like a, a brilliant musician, but it is present everywhere. Because through the hand, man transforms the natural world into a laboratory. By that I mean that man, by means of the hand, takes over the governing of the material world of which he is a part. It is the hand which enables him to make things, to build a house, to draw a picture. It is the hand by means of which ideas locked within his own soul can be brought forth and given symbolic embodiments through the things that he does. All through thousands of years of trial and error experimentation, man has discovered that the eternal law that is in him and in space is perhaps most manifested through the things that he makes with his hands. The individual 
doesn't realize when he nails a box together or makes a chair that in so doing he is calling upon dozens of unfamiliar principles of dynamics, of structure, of stress and strain, and many other things. He is instinctively geometrizing when he makes things. And he puts all these different contrivances together, and in the beginning perhaps he did not put quite the correct number of legs on the chair. As a result of that, the chair did not serve him very well. But before he got through, he found that the least number of legs that would make a successful stool, the least number was three. And he hit upon a truth that was bigger than time. He hit upon a truth that extends all the way from the three legs of the stool to the three persons of the Holy Trinity. He discovered that three was strangely a foundation. He also discovered that the least number of surfaces with which he could enclose an object or an area was four. He discovered also how he could put and combine things together. First he built for utility alone. He didn't care what the stool looked like. There are people like that today. He seems to be perfectly happy to make chairs out of soapboxes. And uh, they don't know the difference or do not seem to. But gradually, man passed from utility to gentility. He passed from making things just because he needed them, and he began to make them beautiful because they pleased him better that way. So out of his hands came also aesthetics, or the beautifying of things. He also found that he could weed a garden with his hands, and in that way he could help the flowers to grow and to make certain things that he wanted more beautiful. And little by little, through objective use of his hands alone, he created the tools that would sometime take the place of his hands, for he fashioned them. But like the car, they are no use unless he holds them. So by degrees the tools became better, simply because the ideas of man grew more rapidly than his hands. And it might take him a million years to evolve a natural coal chisel, so it seemed easier to make one. But all these things which seem to us so trite, so commonplace, and so inevitable, each is a miracle. Each is a wonder in itself, which if we were thoughtful, would tell us something of the mystery of universal life and God and spirit in the universe. But we have, at the time, passed over these things. We take them all for granted as we take the material body which we have for granted. And one of the most wonderful ways to remain ignorant is to take things for granted. Because by so doing, you miss the law. You do not fulfill the requisite set by the Zen priest, who says that in everything that you do, you must find the law. For learning is forever discovering the law. And everything you do, therefore, with your hands, reveals by its propriety or impropriety your knowledge or ignorance of the law. And the most intricate patent that was ever granted was granted only to a person who found a little more complete way of putting the law in motion, or putting the law into formal activity. So everything we do with the hands, everything that our thoughts lead us to transform into action. All this symbolism has to do with the body, with the world, with matter, and with physical things. And the individual who learns to sculpt or form will sometime be able to mold life. We are here to use, to learn, to grow, and to perfect our understanding of this mystery, which we call personal body and universal body. Now, recognizing this world as a laboratory, and realizing that we are in it, and being in it, that we are constantly mingling with other bodies, we come into this amazing realization that we live in a world of forms, each form with some kind of a purpose behind it that we do not comprehend, and that our entire relationship with life as we know it, is merely a relationship of forms. That races and nations and tribes and clans are simply groups of forms, 
and that their psychologies are a compounding glimpse of something that lies behind collective form patterns. Also, around us everywhere in the world, there are problems of adjustment. Problems of adjusting other persons' patterns to our own. One of these means, one of these points means that everywhere around us are men in cars, and that we must adjust ourselves while we drive our car to all the other people who are in cars. And as you know from traffic, that's a tricky situation, and will sometimes be almost more than we can accomplish. We know what happens in traffic if one person makes a foolish mistake how it may result in many cars being involved in a, in a, a terrible compound accident. Almost right there. <laughs> and so, in life, we have relationships. And relationships in the home or in the business, in the factory, in the store, in the club, all these relationships are the meetings, mingling, gatherings, and separatings of forms. We are also aware, however, that each of these forms has a life in it, and that part of these relationships must be the reconciling of the life in us to the life in these other forms. But if the form wasn't there, we wouldn't recognize the relationship or the life. So we have another laboratory, the laboratory of relationships. Form gives us relationships. Form tells us that one individual is a Frenchman, another a German, a third an Italian. Now this does nothing, has nothing to do with what is inside of them, except the fact that the inside is usually psychologically related to the folk or the collective race group to which the individual belongs, related to it by evolutionary process. But now we have these nations, and we have the great political theater in which they can't get together. We also have innumerable problems arising on the form level, and yet these forms are comparatively limited. There's only about two and a half billion of them on earth. These forms also group into patterns, of which there are perhaps three or three hundred and fifty patterns. We have never been able yet to get these patterns together by United Nations, or by eight conferences, or by the League of Nations. Yet here we have forms, each of them with geometrical psychological formulas. And here we have to work them out. So we're on the form world level also, we must solve relationships. We must solve a biological relationship, father and son, mother and daughter. We must uh, solve psychological or theological relationships, husband and wife. We must solve economic relationships, management and labor. We must also solve the great political relationships, the state and the people. We must even go so far as to solve the great bugaboo of all times, the state and the church. These things have to be solved. Here, physically, we can move these chest people around. Here we can see the result of a poor solution. Here we can see what it means when, selfishly, we distort facts for our own convenience. Every mistake that we make materially and physically, we can see. If we cannot see the actual move, we can see the consequences. There can be no doubt. And that's why this dear old world is so highly educational. Here is something that is apparent, obvious, undeniable. We learn in the grand, long picture of it all that to obey is to live and to disobey is to die. That there are no recourses, whatever. And that the only answer that the individual can ever find to his problem is to outgrow his own ignorance. We cannot say that the material world is useless if it makes him learn these lessons. We cannot say the material world is useless if it helps the brother and sister to learn that they have to share their toys. It does not fail. It has meaning as long as it teaches us 
that husband and wife must leave all else and cling to each other. These laws, which have been in operation from time immemorial, tell us things that we all need to learn. And they are the laws upon which we later build into the study of man's higher nature. Because this is the visible seal of all that we do not see. And anything that is solved here forms a foundation to ascend. And anything that is unsolved here will never be solved in any other sphere. That is why the ancient Hindus insisted that there was no evolution between births. That man's growth has to be accomplished in the material world. Here he must make his decisions. Here he must abide by them. Because here and here alone, he cannot influence the results of his own actions. Nor can he close his mind and close his eyes to the hurts and pains that he sees every day. He cannot ignore material things. Here also his standard of values must be mastered. Here he must determine what is valuable. And he can only do so by the slow and difficult trial and error method of putting his faith and his hope on false values and seeing them destroyed. I know a good many persons who have put their hopes on invisible false values. These people have been successfully deluded for a lifetime because they could never actually see their mistake. But if you invest in the wrong stock here, you're not left very much doubt very long. And if your decisions are essentially poor, you will live to see the results. Also, you will see the results of collective mistakes, bad policies, bad laws. You see what happens when we disregard principles. There is no place in the universe where ignorance is more obvious than here. And there is no place where wisdom is more necessary. So out of all this material thing we call the body, we are given the blessed and wonderful privilege of these contacts. We are given the chance to go to school and to learn the first lessons of our own godhood. We are now able to begin to think in terms of the importance of the three R's, including reading, which is now a little neglected. But we also learn how to learn. We skill the tools that we must use. And the individual who is not willing to learn how to use the chisel will never be a great sculptor later. It's the long patience, the struggle, the striving, the disappointments, the tragedies. It is the gradual strengthening of character against adversity and the gradual recognition of principles and their superiority to personal equations. These things prepare us. Prepare us for philosophies. So philosophies, even those of the greatest, are born out of man's earthly need, out of his earthly experience, striving to know. And had it not been for matter, there could have been no Plato, no Buddha, and no Jesus. These things have to be part of man's plan. We could not recognize the solution unless we had the problem. So material things are merely the toys and blocks of infant gods with which they build, which they can assemble, cast down, and reassemble until the forms they fashion meet their pleasure and their need. And each one of us is playing with these cosmic toys as Dionysus played with the toys of Zeus. And from these, this playing, whether it be awkward or skillful, we are gradually learning to understand, learning to know and to grow. And through our sensory perceptions, these observations are taken into our internal lives. Now there's one catch in it, however. And that is that in this playing and growing and learning, and all these activities, the individual is very apt to become a little unbalanced. He is, he is apt to believe that he is merely learning these things in order that he may be successful here and now. That is a mistake. He is not learning simply in order that he can keep on doing the things he is learning forever. That would not be growth. 
If you study the works of a great painter, you will see that in his various years he passes from one style to another until finally he matures to that for which he becomes distinguished. In the same way, the individual, passing through the various periods of living and their experiences, is presumed and supposed to build a philosophy of life based upon observation and reflection, a philosophy suitable to maintain him as a being, as a person in a body. To forget the purpose of life is to be what I would term a materialist. A materialist is not an individual who simply lives here, but an individual who does not realize that he can live anywhere else. A materialist is one who has taken the means for the end, and who believes, for example, that in the conquest of interstellar space, he is fulfilling all the dreams of humanity from the first amoeba up to now. Also, the individual who perhaps believes that if he can be on the first space station, he will establish a precedent that his descendants will remember forever. These limitations destroy the value of schooling. No school child would take the attitude that he's going to school in order to learn how to stay there forever. Nor would he want medical science to find a panacea by which he could remain in the sixth grade for 500 years. What he has forgotten is that he is learning in order that by learning he may fit himself for a constantly enlarging existence. It is his failure to accept that that is his materialism. It is not that he is here that makes him a materialist. It is that he loses interest in being anywhere else and becomes completely satisfied or certain that he has no existence except that of the material schoolroom in which he finds himself. If he takes this attitude, then he closes his mind to such forms of experience as might prepare him for a universal destiny that lies beyond. Fortunately, he can do nothing about it, really. The most he can do is temporarily delay himself. He cannot change his destiny because he has to grow. But he can make growth painful for himself and others if he wants to. If, however, he accepts growth and realizes that materialism is the beginning, is the dark earth in which the seed of immortality is sown, and that without this dark earth below, the magnificent lotus cannot ultimately blossom on the surface of the lake. If he realizes that from materialism, as he calls it, which is the great mother earth of growth, all seeds grow. Their crime is not that they are in the earth, but their crime would be that they do not come out of it. But because of life and life, all good seeds will come out and follow the ancient and inevitable law of growth, which is natural to their kind. So materialism is the individual voluntarily rejecting a larger life and limiting himself and his interests totally to physical concerns. If he does this, he can block his growth for the period of a lifetime. But with the inevitable disintegration of his body, he cannot continue to be a materialist indefinitely. He is protected against these fixations by the law of life and death. And if by some chance his mental fixation is so great that, as the Buddhist doctrine points out, that he can continue to be reborn a materialist for 10, 20, or 50 lives, he will ultimately lose and the universe will win. All he can do is sometime regret that he was so hard to instruct. So materialism, to a degree, is constantly being baffled by the very forces of the material world itself. From the beginning, man has sensed that while he is studying in this amazing classroom by means of this astonishing body which he possesses, 
that this classroom and this body, these two do not constitute his total existence. That these do not have all the answers, nor all the wisdom, nor all the skill. And that there is something else, superior and beyond, which materialism itself gradually reveals. So that ultimately, if any human being studies matter with sufficient earnestness and sufficient continuity of effort, he will ultimately become an idealist. He can't help it. Because matter itself leads inevitably to its own root and source, where it mingles with the streams of eternal life. The human being cannot escape this. He cannot be a devout scientist without ultimately becoming a mystic. But it may take him several lives to pass through this intricate mechanism by means of which he will come to this attainment. But if he is honest, not one moment of it will have been lost. Because in each level he will have gained that which he can use later. It is only if he is false to his own principles that he brings upon himself the penalty of wasted effort. So the body gives us all these opportunities. And on one level, therefore, the body is the teacher. For the body is, strangely enough, the first yogin with which each of us must labor. The body is like some old ancient Hindu holy man sitting quietly on a rock out in the forest or on the edge of some hilly plain. He doesn't speak. He simply sits there. You wonder about him. You wish he would speak. You wonder if he knows you're there. There's something inscrutable and wonderful about him. Perhaps, ultimately, he will become his disciple. And if you do become his disciple, the first thing he will demand of you is utter obedience. You will do what he says. You will obey him. Now, this might sound like he was a very arrogant individual, especially in a good democratic commonwealth like ours. But he is only a symbol. This old gentleman doesn't care whether anyone obeys him or not because he's no longer interested in these things. But he knows that he can never help you unless he can first of all make you recognize the necessity for discipline. Unless you learn to obey him, you will never be able to obey the gods. Unless you have learned first the simple lessons of sincere doing, you will never go on to the great teachings that lie beyond. And this is the way in which the great mother of mysteries, the black Isis, the great symbol of nature herself, operates. And the great temple of the uh, Isis of Sais in Egypt, uh, where the mother of mysteries rules supreme, represented the temple of the material universe, ruled over by the great power of nature, who is man's first and primordial teacher, his eternal nurse, as long as he lives in this world. And those who would go on to the higher mysteries of life must first of all graduate from the school of nature. And they graduate from this school by recognizing the necessity of conquering nature around them and human nature within them. They do this symbolically by putting the body in order. And in this action, they prove their devotion. Therefore, the mudra becomes also not only a seal, but a statement of allegiance. When the individual sufficiently desires truth, that he will control his own life and body in order that he may justify and merit truth, when he is that sincere, he will grow. Until such time as that, he must advance and progress more slowly by the circuitous path of natural evolution itself. The only way the individual can break the rhythm of evolution and grow more rapidly than his world is to control himself more rapidly than others do. And the beginning of this self-control is symbolically the gradual integration of his faculties and his powers. And his willingness, for instance, to accept as an act of worship the soul maturing, developing, normalizing his body that the light within it can shine through and accomplish its purposes. If man, therefore, is not willing to build his temple according to the law, the living God will not dwell therein. And before man was able to have the great religious worship that we know, he first built his altar in the wilderness, 
He built his tabernacle and his temple, his shrine, his mosque, his synagogue. And each of these buildings dedicated to the service of God are physical things, but the God that dwells in them is not. And each of these buildings, perfected by the workmen who gave and concentrated and contributed their costs and causes to this work, these buildings symbolize the integrated human body, the body which is put in order, the body which is transformed from a place of merchandising to a house of the eternal wisdom. So each person makes his statement of faith, makes his declaration of belief, not by words, but by so making his own life orderly and consistent that it bears witness to his sincerity and devotion of others. He can claim anything, but his body cannot be deceived. He can pretend anything, but unless he proves in action that he possesses these abilities of self-control and integration, he cannot deceive anyone but himself. And so the body serves its wonderful and unique purposes. And through it, all the other principles are released into our way of life. And through it also, and by growth, man gains uh, those more subtle experiences. Because just as surely as the physical body of man binds into the physical universe, so there are other levels of the universe to which he is associated by other bodies. And as he unfolds these sequentially and systematically, as he grows within, the universal mystery unfolds around him. For he can see only and understand only according to the instruments that he has built. And if he is dark, the universe is dark. But if he is light within himself, then the universe is enlightened throughout all its parts. Not because it has changed, but because man has then the faculties and perceptions by which he can examine into the greater mysteries of life. So the physical body we feel has been slighted, and the physical part it plays in the growth of man as a spiritual being should be more familiar and better understood by all students who wish to grow in nature's way, which after all is the great way of the spirit, just as surely as it is the great way of philosophy. So next week we will take the next act of this drama, which will be the second of man's bodies, and we will consider more and more the effect of the superphysical vehicles upon the body. But we wanted to sort of orient with the body itself first. Now I'd like to.